Okay, in our last session, we spoke about uh, Charles Morris and we looked at um, Mauritian semiology and his uh, semiological linguistics, linguistic semiology and uh, the like and the ways in which he combined uh, linguistics and semiology and um, the philosophy that accompanied the semiology. And so far we've looked at, of course, uh, a, a, a series of important people in semiology and linguistics and the philosophy of language. Uh, we began with looking at Saussure and then we moved on to Charles Sanders Peirce and if you recall and quite interesting and important, significant, becomes that Saussure was on the that side of the Atlantic and Charles Sanders Peirce was on the other side of the Atlantic. So, you know, they covered both sides of the Atlantic Ocean uh, respectively. And following that, we looked at um, uh, Roland Barthes, then we moved on to uh, Jacques Lacan, and then uh, Charles Morris, and so forth. And, uh, you know, each one of these uh, people we emphasize because each one has uh, covered, worked on a significant part of uh, semiology and signification in relation to linguistics and you know it, it's never been simply about linguistics has it? It's been about uh, linguistics and something else and this is what's actually made linguistics. Linguistics is a field born out of um, eclecticism. You know it has drawn from or you know all academic fields have but it has drawn from a whole bunch of fields including um, literary theory philosophy, existentialism, ontology, epistemology, uh, and so forth. Okay, um, so uh, as promised, as promised today, we will look at uh, somebody who uh, is very, uh, and I, I, I do mean to emphasize this very, very, because he is very, very difficult in the sense that um, you, to, to get this guy, uh, we require, uh, you know, not only a lot of work, a lot of sweat, a lot of time, a lot of resource, much resource, but also a certain imagination. And to understand, uh, begin to understand uh, this person, Emile Benveniste, we, today we'll speak about Emile Benveniste, uh, requires that we uh, pick at what he does, pick at what he does, play with what he does, uh, contextualize what he does, and then sort of get it, get it, you know. Um, it just takes uh, a lot, because unlike others, unlike Jacques Lacan, who was uh, very difficult, but wasn't that extensive, and Roland Barthes was very extensive, but not that difficult to get, Emile Benveniste has been very extensive and very difficult at times. Uh, he's um, you know, he, he really does border on um, or off on the other side philosophy of language. Uh, a lot of his work is philosophical, very philosophical, very critical, and he's very good. He's very good. He did really take uh, the field of um, linguistics forward, and he. Um, he did great things with linguistics and semiology, and we now see uh, something very interesting in uh, what we can discuss about Emil Benveniste. And of course, he um, has given us springboards to uh, move forward and to th rethink, uh, revisualize, reconceptualize Saussurian, Persian, and other work. So we are very grateful to Emil Benveniste. Um, now, I'm going to very quickly, in a second, uh, just uh, describe uh, what we're going to do after Milburn Venist. We're going to look at, uh, I believe, two or three more people. Oh, firstly, we're going to look at uh, Roman Jakobsen. Now, exactly like uh, we spoke about the, um, the, the uh, semiotic uh, value of Charles Sanders Pierce, uh, and we changed that to Peirce because, you know, uh, depending on how well you know the semiotic value, it, it, it projects to you, uh, you um, pronounce it. It's, it's 
Jacobson, uh, Roman Jacobson is the same. So Jacobson is J A C O Jacobson. Uh, however, it's not Jacobson. It's Jacobson. Jacobson. And you know, uh, again, we're going to use our this as an example. Employ this as an example to um, uh, to emphasize how uh, the semiotic works. You know, uh, if we see the J as a Y sound, as a sort of um, soft palate glide, ye or something, then we uh, it's not a J. It's not a it, um, voiced uh, plosive. Alveolar voice plosive, it's a ch ch ch. Okay, rather it's a it's a ye ye. Okay. Anyway, Roman Jakobson. After Roman Jakobson, we will then uh, work towards uh, Umberto Eco, who was also a great uh, great semiotician, um, linguist, and everything. And then we will uh, move back to Helmsler, I believe. I believe. And I think that will be all for now, for now. Unless there is anybody else uh, you guys would like to discuss, and I'd be very happy to um, you know, uh, explore other people with you. And you know, for those of you who have taken my other courses, you know that you know, there are easily another five, 10 um, very prominent academics that we can include, and who we've included in the past, but you know, we have so much more to go through and later on, later on we'll move back to this and we'll possibly extend on the people we've already spoken about and you know, other people who we would like to speak about. And you know, there are definitely, definitely uh, many other people we'd like to speak about and who we haven't included and we don't have resource to do now. Okay, so we will uh, begin speaking about Emile Benvenist. Emil Benvenist. Uh, we will give a, I'll give you a very quick background on Emil Benvenist. Emil Benvenist uh, was a, born into a Sephardi uh, Jewish family in Syria, and he was um, uh, was in yeah, in the Ottoman part of Syria, I believe, in uh, Aleppo, Aleppo, Syria, and he. Uh, 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 was supposed to, being born into a Sephardi uh, Jewish family, he was supposed to, supposed to uh, go to rabbinical school and become a rabbi. And his father wanted him to do this, and you know, he was sent to rabbinical school to become a rabbi, but uh, he moved away from this. And one of the motives for him moving away from this is that uh, he had exceptional, very exceptional, very strong skills in other areas, including um, his, his ability to be critical. And uh, 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 at that time, a Sylvain Levy, a Sylvain Levy, uh, who was, um, we'll speak about Sylvain Levy later on, uh, drew him, sort of drew him away from rabbinical school and uh, introduced him to one of Saussure's students one of Ferdinand de Saussure's students, um, and there he entered the Sorbonne and later on began teaching uh, in uh, the field of semiology and linguistics, and I believe it was the Ecole Pratique de Haute Etude, uh, the Ecole Pratique de Haute Etude, yeah. and there his career took off, and he embarked on his career as a semiologist as a linguist, as a philosopher of language. In 1937, he was uh, um, uh, uh, I guess uh, uh, employed by, or yeah, employed by the uh, Collège de France in 37, and you know, this really springboarded his career as a professor in linguistics, and um, there he expanded on his um, his uh, various interests, including uh, his interest, strong interest in Indo-European languages. And that was a very strong interest of his, and especially Farsi. He did a little work on Farsi, Iranian Farsi. He, you know, he had done work on um, Southern European languages as well. Of course, he, was, he spoke French, and you know, his interest in Greek and Latin and everything uh, was central to everything he did. So he held that seat until uh, 1969, 
And in 1969, you know, those of you who, uh, with whom I've spoken about Emile Benveniste, uh, you know, in 1969, it was uh, the beginning of the end for Emile Benveniste. He uh, got very sick. He had an accident and a uh, stroke, sorry. And uh, he then, uh, you know, became aphasic, aphasia. And that was really, you, you know, the end. He had to retire and everything. I have a friend who's uh, Swedish, um, and she works on aphasia and the linguistics of aphasia. She's, she's working at the University of, 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 of uh, I don't recall, um, Stockholm maybe, I don't know. But uh, she's quite central, and there's a global network there of people doing some very good work uh, on aphasia, and my friend Elizabeth. And it's uh, a global network, so if you ever get time, and actually we've spoken about that, haven't we? Yeah, yeah, we've spoken about that um, at various points, uh, about the aphasia project that Elizabeth and, and others are doing. And it's very good work, very good. It's quite complex and very difficult, and um, many decades have been uh, invested into uh, understanding how aphasia and language uh, work, and uh, Elizabeth is definitely central to this. Okay, so um, he, in 1969, 68, 69, his health began to decline, and um, so he retired and left that post, and um, that's when he uh, had a stroke, and aphasia set in. However, however, uh, he was in 1969, between 69 and 72, he was the first president of the International Association for Semantic Studies. And that is a very big position, a very important position. And he held that for three years despite his declining health. And in uh, the mid 70s, I think it was uh, 1974, uh, Emile Benveniz passed away. And of course, after his stroke, and his declining health, uh, one could only expect that uh, his death was um, uh, to be expected quite soon, imminent. Okay, so there's a quick background on Emil Benveniste. And uh, as I said uh, a few weeks ago, his birth and his death uh, were um, both coincided with the births and deaths of, or well, you know, um, yeah, coincided with births and deaths of others, um, other prominent uh, semologists and linguists, uh, Lacan and Barthes and, and Peirce and um, Morris. You know, it's interesting that many of them, well, of course, Peirce was a little earlier, and, but you know, these three or four were all born and died at pretty much the same time, same time. So it seems to be the era of the great semologists. And also, as I said, not that we don't have some great people now, we have um, Michael Silverstein, for example, and um, Gunther Kress and others, you know, who are doing some great work. We will speak about all of these uh, in, in time, in time. Okay, so who was then Emil Benveniste? Who was Emil Benveniste? Emil Benveniste was a man who uh, was uh, taken from rabbinical school and from a Jewish Sephardi family and um, community. And he uh, became very interested, or he was brought into the world of Saussure. He was also brought into the world of Charles Sanders Peirce. And he saw these two people, and he decided that, well, you know, these people are, have done some very significant work. And having done some significant work as they have, let us see uh, how much value each of their work has. And let us see if we can draw a, a Venn diagram of sorts, a Venn diagram where we have the work of Saussure and we have the work of uh, Charles Sanders Peirce. And let's look at the overlapping part and see what we can make of that overlap, and why it overlaps, and how it overlaps, and the non-overlapping parts. And let's see if 
um, any of these non-overlapping parts uh, actually somehow constitute uh, worthlessness if they should be discarded, you know, if they do not make sense. Or otherwise if they do make sense and why they do not overlap and so forth. So he explored this and he tried to combine the work of Charles Sanders Peirce and Ferdinand de Saussure. And we know that work now very well because we've spoken about it and uh, we've looked at the notes and the readings and I hope that you've all looked at the readings because if you haven't then you're in big trouble and I um, become a, a monster when people don't do the readings. But I'm kidding. I'm just joking. I don't. But please do the readings. It, it really absolutely gives you a, better, a much, much better grasp of everything that's going on. Okay. All right. So combining work. Combining the work of Peirce and Saussure. He, Emile Benveniste uh, decided to observe the similarities and differences of these two people and he was the first person in 69-74 to, in his publications in 69-74, in his La Semiologie de la Langue, La Semiologie, Semiologie de la Langue, uh, to combine these. Okay, the first person to combine these. So the overarching framework then uh, in which language relates to, relates to and distinguishes from other semiotic systems was present in these. Okay, so uh, there was an overarching framework in which language relates to and distinguishes from other semiotic systems. And this is what he presented in his La Semiologie de la Langue in 69 and 74. And in fact, uh, the um, 74 publication was really, a, uh, I guess it was um, supposed to be published uh, prior to his death, but uh, you know, I think it may have even come out posthumously. posthumously. Okay, so uh, what did Benveniste then can focus on, consider doing. He looked at Peirce's theory, uh, which extends sign relations indefinitely. So the Peircean theory is the indefinite semiosis, the perpetual semiosis, as Umberto Eco has also taught us, um, of the sign. You know, uh, one sign produces another and produces another and produces another by interpretants, by interpretants. Um, and this was an understanding of both uh, it being part of the sign and the broader ideological horizon. So this uh, perpetual uh, semiosis was part of the sign, but also a broader ideological horizon, said Peirce. However, uh, this um, work by Peirce, and, uh, and Benveniste certainly agreed to this, was lacking a syntax. Okay, it was lacking a syntax, and it was lacking the associative relations that Saussure himself proposed. So, uh, as uh, Benveniste agreed, Peirce does not discuss the sign system boundaries to define language. It wasn't about boundaries, it was about associations. And so then, uh, what Benveniste decided was that this places Peircean semiotics as relational, but not, and here is a, a word that we will definitely, definitely uh, work on very soon, uh, irreducible. Relational, but not irreducible. And the theory of irreduci irreducibility we will discuss in time, in time, when we have a chance, when we have a chance, but not now, because we do not have the resource, time and um, energy, energy, and focus. We don't have the resource, yeah. Okay, so, um, he, the Benveniste then decided that the domain of semiology is based on the concepts of, on two concepts, one unity and classification. And of course, we know that the uh, unity aspect is the Saussurean aspect. Uh, Saussure was about unity. Um, and when he, of course, when he, uh, especially as he claimed that uh, lung Lung is nothing if not unity. Okay, lung is about unity. 
uh, everybody, everybody has a, so a convention about how to do this language. So it is unifying. It is a unitary um, system of the signs because, uh, mainly because, mainly influenced by the fact that uh, everybody has a certain conception of how these signs should be signified in order to communicate, in order to interact, in order to sin mediate, sin mediate. Okay. So, so Sir's work was really about unity, whereas Purser's work was really about uh, classification. And we recall that you know, Persian work has classification after classification after classification after classification, firstness, secondness, thirdness, divided into three, divided into three, divided into three. You know, a lot of classificatory work. And for Peirce, classification was definitely central. So then Benveniste um, attempts to unify semiology. He attempts to unify semiology um, by claiming that, by arguing that, it deals with arbitrary conventional uh, systems of science. And that was uh, Benveniste's uh, pathway. Pathway. Okay, so uh, you know, uh, Benveniste was a, a initially a Saussurian, and he was brought into the world of Saussure more initially more so than he was brought into the world of Charles Sanders Peirce, and you know he took the work of Saussure and he did agree with a lot of the work of Saussure, but he also um, uh, criticized or uh, contested a lot of the work of Saussure, and this was what brought him uh, a lot of, uh, or a substantial amount of uh, popularity and notability, as he said, look, Saussure has done this and this and this, but I will now um, uh, uh, suggest that this work is unsubstantial in, in certain ways, and we will discuss this in a second. So Saussure posited a, a binary distinction. He posited, Saussure told us that, look, there is a, a signifier and a signified. And we've discussed this, of course. And what does a signifier do? Well, it presents um, an active part of the sign, which is then responded to somehow by um, the signified, which presents a passive part of the sign. And using these words is very dangerous, but you know, you know, we don't care now. We'll just use them, but don't go writing your essays and everything saying uh, Dr. Demetrius Michael Hedzenton has told us that, um, you know, uh, the signifier is active and the, the signified is passive, because actually they're not. But just for now, just for, um, uh, just for uh, our intents and purposes, we will say this. Are you laughing at me? You're laughing at me. That's fine. Okay. So, okay, so this is what Saussure did. He posited a sort of binary. Um, the phonic was the signifier and the mental image was the signified. Okay, it was a binary, it was a binary. And he argued, um, uh, Saussure argued that the, uh, the, the relationship, the sign relationship between the signifier and the signified was um, psychological whatever that means, and I, you, know I, you know I dislike that word, you know, you know I, I don't like that word. Psychology, psychological is a, is a horrible word, and I'm very sorry that it has um, been, uh, it's taken root throughout the ages, throughout the 20th century, and people have grown to love it. It's a horrible, horrible word. It's very wrong, it's a misnomer, and uh, I always contest people who use this term, and I prefer the word uh, somalogy, somalogy. Semology uh, and the such, but okay. So Saussure so, so argued that this word, uh, that this relationship, sorry, is psychological and arbitrary and arbitrary, and then came along Benveniste. And Benveniste challenged this model of the binary. He said, well, actually, it's not a binary. It's quite unitary, unitary. It's quite one, you know. The uh, signified and signified are combined in certain ways so that uh, they're not a binary. They're a unity. They are a unity, not a binary, but a unity. In his 
uh, work. The, and this, of course, emerged in the work Nature du Sing Linguistic. Uh, Nature, Nature du Sin Linguistic. Okay, the nature of the linguistic sign. Nature du Sin de Linguistic. And following this, he published his uh, text, uh, Problème de Linguistique Générale, so Problems of General Linguistics. Okay. And uh, with these two uh, publications, of course, um, Benveniste became, uh, Emile Benveniste, the semiologist and linguist of his time, you know, of his time. What does that mean? Because there were two or three others, five others, who were also doing great work, but not in, you know, not as a, uh, definitely not as a challenge to Saussure. Okay, so the two volumes of this work then, Problems in General Linguistics, appeared in 66 and 74, and uh, respectively, and um, you know, 74 was his death. Okay. So um, this nature of the linguistic sign then was um, uh, a characteristic of Emile Benveniste's views on linguistics, and in that way we um, see the work that he's done. Okay, so Emile Benveniste was um, definitely concerned with the ways in which the ways in which the signs work for the human subject. He was interested in the activity of the signs in the human subject and the ways in which these signs um, uh, affected some sort of change in the subject, in the human subject. And he was also interested in exploring the the outskirts of the signs, not just the sign itself, but how they work outside of the sign to include other aspects of the sign. And he was also concerned in how these signs um, direct a sort of um, interest in exploring, further exploring Caesarean work and Caesarean sign theory. 